our everyday concept of work is anything that requires us to use energy. However, the scientific concept of work is far more strict or far more formal than that because scientifically work is only done when a force is applied on an object and the object moves in the direction of the force. So we have a formula here that tells us that the work done by force F is equal to the product of that force and the displacement of that object also multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement. So we can demonstrate that very simply with an example of an applied force pushing a box seven meters across a horizontal surface and we can calculate the work done by that applied force using this formula that tells us that the work done by the applied force is equal to the product of the applied force and the displacement of the object and the cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement. The applied force has been given to us as 120 newtons, the displacement given to us as 7 meters, and in this case we can see that the force is applied to the right and the displacement is also to the right, which means that the angle between the two is zero, which means that this is the cosine of zero, which we know is one. So we can say that 840 joules of work has been done by the applied force to move the object across the surface. Where this becomes complicated is that we know that while this is happening, there is also a force of gravity acting on this object force of gravity that is pulling this object downward into the earth, which we can see is 98 newtons. But now to demonstrate the fact that scientifically that force of gravity is doing no work, we can show that the work done by the force of gravity is equal to the force multiplied by the displacement multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two, where the force is given as 98 newtons. The displacement here is 7 meters. And now what we can see is that the displacement is to the right, but the force is downward, meaning that the angle between the two is 90 degrees. And so we can say that the work done by the force of gravity on this object while moving seven meters to the right is zero joules. So we're saying that the force of gravity does no work on this object. A slightly more complicated example here would be when the force that's being applied is no longer applied horizontally or vertically, but now applied at some angle theta. And that's where we find that this cos theta term in the work formula helps us because normally what we would be required to do is first calculate the two components. So we would say, if this is a tension force, we would say that there is a vertical component to this tension force, which is calculated as T sine theta, and there is also a horizontal component of this tension force calculated as T cos theta. Now, the formula for work done by the tension force negates the need for that because the work done by the tension force is equal to the tension force multiplied by the displacement of that object multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. And as we can see, this formula already includes the cosine that we want here, so we can simply substitute in our tension force of 100 newtons as it's given, the displacement of this object as 15 meters as given, and the cosine of the angle between these two now, as we can see, this object is displaced to the right, and the force is 30 degrees upward from that, which then tells us that we can calculate our total work done as 1299.04 joules. So as we can see, we could have also calculated this separately and said the work done by the vertical component, I'm sorry, the horizontal component of the tension force and then TH times displacement cos theta. But the result would be the same because our horizontal component we know is 86.6. The displacement is 15 and now since we have the horizontal component the, the angle between them is zero and the result would be exactly the same. So this work formula already includes the cosine so that it calculates only the component of the force that is acting 
in the direction of the displacement. Once we understand how the scientific concept of work applies for individual forces acting on an object, it becomes important to understand how we can calculate the network that is done on an object. And there are two ways in which that can be done. The first way, we will use this example over here where we have a tension force of 100 newtons pulling an object 15 meters to the right across a horizontal surface with a frictional force of 20 newtons acting on that object. The first way in which we can calculate the network done on this object is we can take the sum of the work done by each force acting on the object. So we start out by saying the work done by the gravitational force is zero joules. The reason for that is because the displacement is to the right and the gravitational force is at an angle of 90 degrees downward to that. So there's zero work done by the gravitational force. The same follows for the normal force acting upward from the surface. The tension force, we can calculate the work done by realizing that the displacement is now to the right and the angle between the two is now 30 degrees as given there. And we can calculate the work done by the tension force as 1,299 joules. The frictional force we can now see is a force of 20 newtons multiplied by the displacement. The difference here is that the displacement is to the right and the friction acts 180 degrees to that, so cos of 180. And as we can see, we get a negative work value here. That does not mean that this is a negative value. It means that energy is removed from the system. So what we can see in the network done here it is the sum of all of the forces acting on the object and the work done by the gravitational force is zero, the work done by the normal force is zero, the work done by the tension force is 1299 joules and the work done by the frictional force is negative 300 joules which should make sense because the force pushing it to the right is adding energy while the frictional force is slowing it down making it more difficult therefore removing energy and our result then is that we have a network of 999 joules added to the system. The second way in which the network can be calculated for this object is we can find the network done by the net force acting on that object. So instead of finding the work done by each force, we can first calculate the network and we can see that in the vertical plane, there is a force of gravity, a tension force, a vertical component and a normal force and the result there is zero because this object is not moving upward or downward and then in the horizontal plane the network done is equal to the horizontal component of tension pulling it to the right minus the friction force acting to the left so we find our net force is then 66.6 .6 newtons to the right so we can calculate the net work done on this object then by taking that net force 66.6 .6, multiplying it by the displacement of 15 and the net force acts to the right as well as the displacement which is to the right so it is cos of zero and that would then give us exactly that same network done on the object. What's important to see here is that since work is a scalar quantity a positive value of work means that energy has been added to a system a negative value of work means that energy has been removed from the system. In both of these examples, particularly this one, we can clearly see that the force that is pulling the object or moving it to the right is adding energy to the system, while the force that is acting against that motion is removing energy from the system. What's also important to see here is that that energy can be added usually in one of two ways. In this example here, since we have a non-zero net force that means that by Newton's second law this object is going to accelerate. Since it, it accelerates that means the velocity will change which means that its kinetic energy will change because a kinetic energy is the energy as a result of the motion of an object. It is also possible to be work to add energy to potential energy in which case this is normally done when an object is lifted upward we know that the potential energy of an object is dependent on the mass of that object and at height above the Earth's surface. So when we are doing work on an object, we are normally adding energy and that energy can be added in one of two forms.
we know that energy is the capacity to do work and we deal most often with energy in two forms those being kinetic energy and potential energy where we know that kinetic energy is the energy an object possesses as a result of its motion and this is essentially the energy that a moving object has that would be required to be transferred or removed in order to change the motion of that object. Now as a result of that definition we say that EK is equal to one half times the mass of that object times the velocity of that object squared. So what this tells us is that energy is directly proportional to the mass of the object, meaning if the mass increases the amount of energy increases and it is directly proportional to the velocity of the object squared. What this also tells us is that there's an exponential relationship there saying that the faster the object moves the more energy it has. We know that mass must always be measured in kilograms in physics and velocity is always measured in meters per second. And what we can see here is that the two factors that affect the kinetic energy of an object being mass and velocity, by increasing them you are saying that this moving object has more energy and therefore would require more energy or work to stop it or to change that energy. The second type of energy that we deal with often is potential energy. The energy an object possesses as a result of its position relative to others and the most common potential energy that we will be dealing with is gravitational potential energy. This is the energy that an object has as a result of its distance from the surface of the earth because we know that as you lift an object from the surface of the earth you are giving it the potential to fall back down because it is attracted by the force of gravity and so we say that the potential energy, gravitational potential energy of an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the gravitational acceleration multiplied by the height of that object above the surface of the earth where we know that mass again measured in kilograms g is our constant of 9.8 meters per second per second and h is the height above the surface of the earth measured in meters. So what this shows us is that the potential energy that an object possesses is directly proportional to the mass, meaning that a heavier mass has more energy or more potential to fall down to the earth again, and it is also directly proportional to the height above the earth, once again saying that the higher an object is, the more potential energy it has to fall back down to the surface of the earth. And then finally, we would sometimes refer to mechanical energy, where mechanical energy is the sum of your kinetic and potential energy. We say EM is equal to EK plus EP. And in most cases, mechanical energy would be conserved. We know that this applies most often in roller coasters and swings, where an object that is stationary at the top meaning it has zero kinetic energy but has potential energy and then as that object falls or moves down to the bottom its speed picks up because the kinetic energy is becoming or coming from potential energy and then as it moves up the other side again the kinetic energy is converted once again into potential energy. Important to note here that there are other types of potential energy there is also elastic potential energy that is the result of a stretched elastic. Obviously, again, the motion relative to each other as you pull an elastic further away, the amount of potential increases. There is also electrical potential energy that is as a result of placing a charged object in an electrical field. And so there are a number of different potential energies but the most common one that we will be dealing with is gravitational potential energy. We would usually have to use a combination of Newton's laws and equations of motion in order to relate a force that's applied to an object to the motion of that object. So in an example that we have here, 
we have a tension force of 100 newtons applied at an angle of 30 degrees on a 10, 10 kilogram object. The object moves 15 meters to the right and there's a frictional force of 20 newtons. And the question here would ask something along the lines of calculate the final velocity or the velocity after 15 meters. And then we would need to start by calculating the horizontal component of the tension force, then the net force acting on that object, and then use Newton's second law to find the acceleration of that object and then find this appropriate equation of motion to determine the velocity of this object, which we find here is 14.14 meters per second to the right. Now, once we have a concept of work, we can use the work energy theorem, which states that the net work done on an object is equal to the object's change in kinetic energy. That can be written in a formula as net work is equal to delta EK or EK final minus EK initial, where we remember that EK is our kinetic energy, which is the energy as a result of an object's motion. So now what this allows us to do is we can, using the net force that is acting on this object, we can calculate the net work because we know that net work is equal to the net force multiplied by the displacement of the object multiplied by the cosine of the angle between these two. And the change in kinetic energy here is going to be the final kinetic energy, which is one half mvf squared minus the initial kinetic energy. And in this case, this object was stationary, so the initial kinetic energy was zero. Our net force, as we've calculated here, is 66.6 newtons. The displacement, we've been told, is 15 meters. And the net force and the displacement are in the same direction, so the angle between them is zero. And we have the mass of the object given as 10 kilograms. And then the final velocity is the only unknown here, where we can solve for our final velocity to find that it is 14.14 meters per second to the right. As we can see, this is a far simpler method as it very easily relates work to energy and allows us to, without this long-winded method of going through net force and then equations of motion, it allows us to immediately, based on the force acting on an object, determine the motion of that object. It is important once again here because this reminds us that when we have a positive work that is done on an object. When the work done on an object is greater than zero, it means that the energy of this object would increase. As we can see here, this object has gone from having zero kinetic energy after having positive work done or a positive net force acting on it, the amount of energy that that object has increases. And then conversely, we know that if the work done on an object is negative, what that would mean is that the energy of that object decreases or energy is removed from that object. So we could say that that object would slow down. A conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points is independent of the path taken. The three most common conservative forces are the gravitation force between objects with mass, the electrostatic force between charged objects and the elastic force exerted by a spring or an elastic. There are two terms that are important to understand, to understand a conservative force. And the first is that the work done by a conservative force is independent of the path taken. And we can demonstrate that with an example here where we have a two kilogram object that is taken from being at rest on the surface of the earth and then raised to a height of two meters above the surface of the earth. Now we know that this work needs to be done against the force of gravity. We know that the force of gravity acting on this object is the product of the object's mass and the gravitational acceleration. Therefore, the force of gravity acting on this object is 19.6 newtons. What we can also see here is that in order to raise this object up, a certain amount of work is going to be done by the force of gravity. And we know that that is the product of the force the displacement of the object and the cosine of the angle between those two. What we can see here is that the force of gravity always acts vertically downward. We have been told that this object has been displaced vertically upward and therefore we can say that our work done by the force of gravity is 19.6 times 2 meters 
times the cosine of those being in opposite directions, therefore 180 degrees, and therefore we get a work done as negative 39.2 joules. So we can now say that the work done by the force of gravity here is negative 39.2 joules. And then what's important to note and understand is that we say it's independent of the path taken because the force of gravity always acts vertically downward. So if this object was raised to a height two meters above the ground and also moved horizontally, ultimately, because the force of gravity always acts vertically downward, it is only going to be that component that contributes to the work that is being done. And so we often asked a question in which we are asked to compare moving an object vertically upward or moving it at an angle upward, or even if one were to move it in some strange path, ultimately all that matters is the vertical displacement of that object. And that is why we say that a conservative force is independent of the path taken. The second term that's important to understand is that we have said that this is a conservative force. The reason for that is because conservative forces always have an associated potential energy. We know that there is a gravitational potential energy that is the product of an object's mass, Earth's gravitational acceleration and the object's height above the surface of the Earth. So we know that this object initially had a mass of 2 kilograms, Earth's gravitation was 9.8, but the height was zero, and therefore it had zero gravitational potential energy. What then happened is this object was raised to a height of 2 meters above the surface of the Earth, and as a result it gains a certain amount of potential energy, that amount being 39.2 joules. And this is what explains why we call it a conservative force, because as we can see, when there is work done by the force of gravity, despite that being energy that appears to be lost, it is actually converted into another form and able to be used later. So we say it's a conservative force because work done against that force is always converted into another form of energy that can still be used. So there are two important things to remember when considering conservative forces. The first is that the path that is taken does not affect the amount of work that is done because it is the displacement of the object that matters and when you are doing work against gravity all that matters is the vertical height change. And the second thing that's important to remember is that it's conservative meaning that energy is not lost but normally converted into some other form of potential energy. The work conservative force does not change the mechanical energy of the system where we know that a conservative force is a force for which the work done is independent of path and we know that the mechanical energy of an object e mech, is the sum of an object's kinetic energy and its gravitational potential energy and we can demonstrate this with a simple example of a ball that is thrown vertically upwards with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. It is a two kilogram ball and we can use the equations of motion to determine that it will reach a maximum height of 5.10 meters. This is obviously in the absence of air friction. Now what we can do here is we can start by calculating the initial kinetic energy of this object. We know that kinetic energy is one half times the mass of the object multiplied by its initial velocity squared. In this case, that is one half times two times negative 10 squared, which gives us an initial kinetic energy of 100 joules. Now, what we can see here is we can see that when this object reaches its maximum height, we can see that since there is no motion or there is no velocity, that would clearly mean that there is no kinetic energy. Now, since we know that gravity is a conservative force, we can see that this energy has not been lost, but only converted into another form. And we can show that with potential energy, where at the start of this object's motion, its initial potential energy is the product of its mass multiplied by gravitational acceleration multiplied by its height above the ground.
mass of 2 kilograms, gravity of 9.8, and it started on the ground, so its initial potential energy was zero. And we can very clearly see at the end, though, when its kinetic energy is zero, we can see that since it now does have a certain height above the ground, it will very obviously have a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. And that is an amount of 99.96 joules of gravitational potential energy. So what we can see here is that our amount of mechanical energy at the beginning is equal to the amount of mechanical energy at the end. Obviously the slight difference here is as a result of the rounding that takes place and we can demonstrate that that is as a result of the work that is done by the gravitational force with our formula which says that the work done by the gravitational force is equal to the product of the gravitational force, the displacement of the object and the cosine of the angle between them where the force of gravity is 19.6 newtons, the displacement is 5.1 meters and since these are in opposite directions we can see that the force of gravity does a negative amount of work, negative 99.96 joules. So what this shows us is it shows us that the force of gravity does negative work on this object which we would normally associate with energy being removed from the system. But because gravity is a conservative force, that energy is not removed but merely transformed into another form, transformed from kinetic energy into potential energy and we know that if this object were allowed to continue in its motion we know that that potential would decrease as the kinetic increases as this object starts to fall back down to the earth and so what this gets us to is a form of conservation of energy which tells us that in the absence of non-conservative forces the energy of the system will not change which means that the initial mechanical energy will be equal to the final mechanical energy in the system for as long as there are no non-conservative forces acting. A non-conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points depends on the path taken. So there are two important things to consider in this definition. The first one is the dependency on the path taken. We can demonstrate that with a common example of a non-conservative force where an object is being pushed across a surface that has friction and we can say that the work done by the frictional force is equal to friction times the displacement of the object times the cosine of the angle between the two. Now we know that friction always acts parallel to the surface in the opposite direction to motion and we can see here that the object is moving and for argument's sake we'll say that this argument moves 50 meters. So we can then say that the work done by friction is equal to the frictional force of 300 newtons multiplied by the displacement of 50 meters multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two which is 180 degrees since they are opposite to each other and what we can see here is that the total amount of work done by the frictional force is negative 15,000 joules what this tells us is that friction removes 15,000 joules of energy from the system. Now, the dependency on path taken tells us that if this object were to move further, say for example 70 meters, the work done by friction would then change because it's then friction once again times displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. Friction here is still 300, but because the displacement is greater, we can now see that there is more energy that is being lost because the further the path is, the more energy would be lost. So that is the first important thing to understand in a non-conservative force is that it depends on the path taken, basically saying the longer the path, the more work needs to be done against that force or for that force. The second is the idea that it is non-conservative basically referring to the conservation of energy here where we know that a conservative force means that the energy is conserved or transformed into another form a non-conservative force is one where that energy is lost and cannot be recovered so we know that friction often converts a certain amount of energy into heat 
and sound and various other forms and that energy cannot be regained. So the energy that is lost to friction cannot be regained in the same way as another common applied, uh, another common non-conservative force being the applied force or being the tension force, where once that force has been exerted and the energy has been transformed, that energy is lost and cannot be regained into its original form. So very important for non-conservative forces, firstly, the fact that they depend on the path taken. The longer the path, the more energy is required or the more work is required. And they are non-conservative, meaning that that energy that is used in overcoming or in using that force is lost and not conserved. The work done by a non-conservative force on a system is equal to the change in mechanical energy of the system, where we remember that the mechanical energy of an object is the sum of that object's kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and that object's potential energy, the energy as a result of its position above the Earth's surface. So what this tells us is that when a non-conservative force does work on a system, it actually changes the energy of the system. If it does positive work on that system, it will increase the amount of energy in the system, and if it does negative work, it decreases the amount of energy in a system. We can demonstrate this with a common example that we would have done in grade 11 of an object rolling down a slope. So here we have a two kilogram ball that is held or released from rest at the top of a three meter high incline that is 10 meters long. And we are told that there is a frictional force of five newtons acting on this object. Now traditionally we would have resolved this gravitational force acting on this object into its components. We would have then been able to calculate the net force acting on this object. Using that, we would have been able to find the acceleration of the object and then use an equation of motion to determine the final velocity. But what we can now say is we can say that since this object has a force of gravity, which is a conservative force acting on this object, and a non-conservative force of friction acting on the object, we know that only the non-conservative force is going to have an effect on the mechanical energy of this object. So we can start out with this formula that is given to us that tells us the change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by the non-conservative force, which we can rewrite as the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy minus the initial kinetic and potential energies must be equal to the work done by friction, since that is the only non-conservative force. We can then substitute in the formulae for each of these and then substitute in the values that we have been given. So we've been told that this object has a mass of two kilograms. The final velocity is our unknown that we are trying to find. We know that when this object reaches the final point, we know that the height then is going to be zero. And so that makes that final potential energy zero. We were also told that this object was released from rest, meaning that the initial velocity is zero which means that the initial kinetic energy is also zero. And then we can calculate the initial potential energy by taking the product of the mass, Earth's gravitational acceleration, and that object's initial vertical height, because that is what results in a gravitational potential energy. We know that this is going to be equal to the amount of energy that is lost due to friction, we were told that the frictional force is 5 newtons, the displacement of the object is 10 meters, and friction and displacement are always opposite to each other. And what that allows us to do then is it allows us to solve for our unknown final velocity to see that it is 2.97 meters per second. And this is because a certain amount of energy has been lost and that energy is lost to friction so what we are saying here is we're saying that the amount of energy that's lost is equal to the amount of work that was done by a non-conservative force on the system. It is also important to see that this formula can also be applied to systems that do not have non-conservative forces present, because if there is no non-conservative force present, that would mean that there is no work done by a non-conservative force. And we know that a change in mechanical energy essentially means the final mechanical energy minus the initial mechanical energy, which can then be rewritten as the initial mechanical energy is equal to the final mechanical energy.
it must just be noted here that this formula is not given in the exam and may not be used except when it has been derived from here. So this is the given formula. We can then say since there is no non-conservative force in an example where you have been told that, since there is no non-conservative force, we can then say that final mechanical energy minus the initial is equal to zero and therefore the initial mechanical must be equal to the final mechanical energy in a system where there is no non-conservative force. Power is the rate at which work is done or energy is expended. And from that definition, we can find the formula which says that the rate at which work is done, meaning the amount of work divided by the amount of time that it would take. And so we can demonstrate the difference between work and power with a very simple example. We can show an example here of a person who has applied a 1000 Newton force to push a car a distance of 10 meters and we can then use our original formula for the work done by the applied force to find that it is the product of the applied force, the displacement and the cosine of the angle between the two. The applied force was given as 1000, the displacement was 10 meters and the applied force and displacement were in the same direction and therefore we can say that this person or this applied force has done 10,000 joules of work. Now, until this point, we have not discussed the speed at which anything is done. Because obviously there's a very big difference between this being done in 3 seconds compared to this being done in 30 seconds, or this being done in 10 seconds compared to being done in 100 seconds. And that difference is what we call power. Because we can say, if this is done in 10 seconds, so it takes this person 10 seconds to push the car 10 meters, then we can say that this person's power output is the work over the time that it took. The work done we just said was 10,000 joules and the time in this first example was 10 seconds which means that the average power output was 1,000 and what we can see here is that would be joules per second which we can also just call the units for power as watts. So this person's power output was 1000 watts. Whereas this can be changed now to say, well, what would happen if this took 20 seconds? We can see that it is still possible to apply a 1000 Newton force and move the car that 10 meters. The difference now though would be that that work done would be still the same. The force and the displacement are the same, but the time has now changed, which means that less power was required as we can see the work done is still 10,000 joules. The time is now 20 seconds, which means that there were only, or there was only a power output of 500 watts. This is a very small addition to the work energy power section, as it is very often just the last question where once you have calculated the work done by a force or the network, you can then calculate the power output once you have been given a time component. It is also possible to adapt this formula as we know that work is the product of force and displacement and the cosine of the angle between the two and we can then rearrange that formula to see that displacement over time is also the velocity and so what we can find is that a simplified formula for average power p average is equal to the force times the average velocity of an object which is useful because it is now we are now capable of calculating the power output for any object that is moving at a constant velocity by just using the force and that average constant velocity.